Yes. Thank you, Lord, for being in this wonderful place to talk about wonderful subjects. Uh, yes, I will cover uh, two papers that I uh, worked on with Constantino and more recently with Simon and Giuseppe uh, back in Indiana. And both of them treat the general concept of bounding paper relations if you have memory constraints. And this is more like a causality notion than uh, specifics of all time, but let's uh, go through it. So, as a general motivation for this research, uh, as has been mentioned just now, our fiscal theories uh, generally involve this notion of causality, which came from observations uh, in nature, right? Which intuitively, intuitively means that information has to flow from the past into the future, right? And in a sense, the fiscal systems are what's storing and carrying this information. And we also have this idea that if the amount of information has to be in some sense finite. Because if you have infinite amount of information stored in finite region of space time, we expect that it's a collective level. So if you take these ideas, these general ideas at heart, basically that means the finite systems will be using some finite notion of memory to store this information when they generate temporal correlations when we observe their dynamics in time, etc. So two questions are motivated by this. One is that if you are restricted by causality, which observations are possible if you have bounded memory? And depending on the kind of memory, which is classed with quantum how it's stored, what kind of uh, things is possible with different types of this memory? So the picture here is, is just Alice in a room, for example, doing an experiment in a physical system. And as time passes, she collects statistics, and you want to know what kind of things are possible to be observed given this internal system. So the general goal of here is to define basically a notion of complexity for finite sequence of cause the order events. So basically, once you do your temporary experiment, you get a distribution of the inputs and outputs. And we want to find what the minimum resources required to realize this distribution in, in, in these causal constraints. Uh, the goal here, of course, is to understand causality in terms of these information processing tests. Here we're talking about information storage and manipulation of this information by the physical systems. And we want to study classic quantum differences uh, in terms of this temporal perspective as well. And also, of course, just hoping to bring new insights to this nature of time and how about right? The strategy here is to really approach it as an intrinsic property of the physical theories and the systems. So we want to know how they're limited by generating those correlations and so on. Uh, so the first paper is this one with the motion of Cosentino, uh, which is we analyze the simplest case possible. So in this paper, we have the following assumptions. We have a single isolated system with a finite number of internal states, which we call D. And this is the memory or the dimension. We use this terms kind of interchangeable in this work. So we're going to assume that we have a finite and discrete sequence of time-ordered uh, events. And this, uh, sorry, uh, measurements. And these measurements are also time invariant. You're always performing the same things. So there's no actual behavior. So this means that there's no inputs or settings in your measurement, and you only have two outcomes, which is the simplest scenario possible, hence the name of the, the paper. So before each measurement, we also assume that the system has to be reset to a predefined state, because we can do preparations this one. Uh, so this is not a stationary process, but typically people analyze this uh, stochastic process kind of analysis of temporal uh, time series like this. Uh, so the system has to, in a sense, assemble all correlations from scratch. And we also assume there's no free time evolution between measurements. So we want to capture all the dynamics coming from the invasiveness of these measurements, even in the classical case. Uh, the intuition here is that I, I give you a mystery box, which has only a single big red button on top that creates a measurement, which whatever internally that means. And you have a reset button on this in the front. And you can pre press the reset button, press measure button as many times as you want, and you can collect statistics on this temporal, on this bit streams, right? And given that you've got a statistics or distribution, what looking at distribution could tell us about the internal memory of what's happening inside this box, right? For now, we don't look at the whole distribution. We look just at individual sequences one at a time. And to model this kind of behavior of these objects, we use finite state automata. So in the classical case, it's nice to, to visualize. So basically, when you reset the state, you go to this state here, the first state with the bold arrow. And the blue transitions are associated with zero outcomes. And what the red transitions are from one outcomes. And each transition can have a probability. All this is in the classical picture. The quantum picture is not easy to draw, but 
The idea is that as you press the button, you're just doing kind of a random walk on this, on the, on this graph. So you see here that all the outcomes are uh, leading to the actual state transitions, which we call a video counter. Physically, this means that the measurements are invasive. So this is essential to capture quantum mechanical behaviors. Even though this model is classical, that I can show you, we use the same idea for the quantum case. So we can actually describe explicitly this model with a transition model, which I'm going to show you soon. And the goal of this work is to find the optimal models that produce a given sequence that you fix for a given fixed number of internal states. So what does this model look like? Uh, it's not super important to, to look into for this talk. But basically, for the classical model, they're going to be a pair of substochastic matrices that sum to something stochastic. Uh, the probability is computed by something like this, where you just have a chain of the, the powers of these transition matrices. And by convex, since you want to maximize probability, we can fix the initial pure state, uh, and we can fix it to the first one, it doesn't matter. In the quantum case, we have a quantum instrument, and it's defined by two effects, which are the CP maps, or quantum deposit maps. And together, they have to be unital. In this case, just because we're oh, using Heisberg features, so it can be nice and sequential left to right. Um, but yes, in my convex in quantum case, you can also assume an initial pure state because we want to maximize this probability. Right? So now that we have this picture, suppose I want to find this in this model. I want to do this in the computer, except I have to pick a, D, a, a number of states. Right? So one way to inform this, uh, which states are uh, number of states are interesting to the study, is to look at the deterministic behaviors. It turns out that if you have a, a sequence of being observed probably one, then uh, a quantum model that produces that sequence doesn't need any coherence. So you could actually simulate the classical model with the same number of states. So then the question is, when can these deterministic models exist for each individual sequence? Knowing this, we have then a fundamental causal or memory constraint for each sequence, which is kind of complex with this. And it gives a threshold for the range of parameters of dimensions we can look for interesting behaviors. So this defines the deterministic complexity, which we introduced in this paper, which is a sequence, uh, which is a property of the sequence, which is the minimum number of states d such that there is a, a model of class for quantum that such that probability one is achievable. Right? In other words, if you have number of states in your device that is less than the deterministic complexity of a particular sequence, then no matter if you do a class for quantum case, you only have uh, a finite probability below one, three to below one for any possible behavior, right? So there has to be a, a, a non-trivial maximum probability. And these are exactly the scenarios that are interesting to investigate. Uh, and this here is just something that you can compute, there is complexity, and it's a property of sequences, this is important. So the intuitive, intuitive picture you should have by now is something like this. Since the memory of this number of states is the resource you use to construct a sequence to this correlation in time, uh, you imagine that as you add more states, you get a more and more probability until you reach the C of probability one. So keep this picture in mind. Uh, so now that we have this idea, we can look for explicit models to get a sense of what this problem actually looks like, because we have no idea what to expect. So we actually perform numerical optimization to look into this. So for we fix a uh, sequence, we fix a dimension for the internal space, and we just run this optimization for the classical case. We also do for the and then also go through it there. Uh, so this is a high eventual global optimization problem. It's extremely difficult to actually find the tie that we're bounds. Uh, so we set up for gradient descent, which, you, which gives us a lower bound, uh, uh, but still interesting results to look at. So this is, for example, once one model, classical model, where we found. And you see here that uh, this is for the sequence 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. It has a principle of 5, so it needs 5 to be released. It 4, so it has to have a maximum probability that's below 1. And this is the kind of weird model we get. And this is a very typical scenario. You always have some model that's very weird, and typically you're going to see mixtures of probability 1 and probability below 1 transitions, so it's a mutual deterministic and probabilistic behaviors. So it's a very rich problem, even in the simple case. And this is some example, for example. Uh, so the vision of all the possible trajectories that one can do. And all of this produces the same sequence. Each one of these trajectories has a different probability of occurring. So in the end, if you just look at the sequence, it could be any of this happening with the series of this, and this is the origin of the structure. So after we look at the data, one thing that was pretty interesting is that a particular class of sequences seem to be very important and special, which we call the one-tick sequences, because it looks like a kind of a clock. Thing we would do, right? No tick, no tick, and in the end, we uh, And we have a conjecture, because we couldn't prove this yet, 
that the optimal models for the sequence is actually very simple and have the structure we call the enhanced smooth sequence model. Uh, move the sequence because you have a series of cycles and it's enhanced because it has this little tail at the end. Like, so you have a bunch of zero transitions and only again you have a one in the end of this tail. And this is actually nice because it's a model we can parameterize directly. We can find an analytical expression for probability and find the optimal. Uh, and it's also interesting because this particular model can use construct number bound for the other sequences. So this is the main conjecture of this first paper, which is the one tick sequences actually can be used to compute the number bound for all other cases. And it works like this. You have your sequence uh, that you want to compute, the bound. You put the same number of states for this probability. And here you have the one tick sequence, right? But the one tick sequence has a length of the size of the complex of the sequence. And you use the enhancement sequence model for this particular thing here with this t to compute the probability. And remember here that this t here is a very complicated structure, and this enhancement sequence model is something very simple, like I showed in the previous slide. Right? So to go through it a little bit just very quickly, so suppose we have this sequence, right? It is complex 5, 3, for example. So this is going to be a there has to be some uh, non trivial probability here. We replace the number of states and the determinant complexity here. And then what we get is you have something that's very complicated here, like those crazy models that I showed in the nation, uh, with three states. And here you have something very simple that you can compute analytically. And if you verify through the data set we have, all this seems to match pretty well. So this is a conjecture. We don't have a proof of this. It's very deceptively simple. But one thing that's cool is that if this conjecture is true, we can prove it, we prove it then for all classical models, there is a universal classical per bound of probability. If you don't have enough states to be deterministic, so these models to this complex of the sequence, then the maximum probability that can actually occur is 1 over E, which is about 37%. And this is true for any self-deterministic classical case. So alternatively, this actually is a dimensional weakness for classical systems. If you have a, a probability that you observe for a sequence larger than 1 over E, then you know that the number of states of whatever box, classical box is related this, it has at least these C states, which is a very interesting result. So remember that picture before? That's the intuition you would gradually go up. What we find is that there's this sharp transition between sub-deterministic and deterministic behaviors under this DC threshold, which is pretty interesting. Uh, we also look at a quantum case, uh, and I just go briefly to it. It's kind of hard to explain how we do the optimization. But you, as, it, as you would expect, you see a lot of uh, advantage in the quantum case here on top over the classical models. The classical models are confined by the one over the bound, but the quantum models generally are not which is pretty interesting. Note, notice that here, for the quantum case, we also have the choice of how many uh, crowds operators, let's say, you want to use to specify the CP maps for all from zero on one. And we, we also this this for one, two, and three, and we see that there is no advantage, basically. We see that the lines are basically uh, coincident, except at the end, which is basically numerical error, because the space is larger, it's hard to optimize. We don't know why that's the case, why you want to keep the purity and do everything with clearance. It would be nice to approve. Uh, yes, uh, we also have this intuition before, right? That since the memory is the, is the resource, if you have less, then it's going to be more difficult to generate a certain sequence with this resource. So if you take two states off the deterministic case, then both classical and quantum problems drop significantly. And now even quantum mechanics struggles to, to saturate this one really bad. But some sequences still do well. You also have this weird jump here, which I'm not sure if it's meaningful. But uh, it's interesting that. In this case, it seems that some scenarios now become identical on the quantum and the classical case. So if we remove sufficient number of states, it feels from this, we don't have an understanding of this, that the, the quantum data disappear somehow, which will be interesting to understand. And we also investigated with an ASATS the quantum sequence in the large unit, and we have a, a, an example for this for the quantum case. And we managed to optimize, and we don't seem to have a, a non trivial overbound for the quantum classical behavior. Right, so this is the first part. How much time do I have? Uh, 15 minutes. Ah, perfect. Maybe uh, So the second part, we apply the same ideas, but now for the, uh, for the concept of trying to characterize the minimum dimension compatible with the statistics you observe in an open quantum system scenario. So you have your, your little probe system like a qubit, and you, let's say it's directed with another qubit, and if this qubit is your environment, your effective part of your environment is just interacting with 
can we put, put a bounds on the different provisions that you could observe when the environment is carrying information from the past to the future for your system or for your set of measures? So this is kind of what it looks like. We assume we have an effective environment because the environment is way larger, but the part of the environment you're acting with has a dimension E, and you have a probe system with dimension DS. So we assume, as before, we have a discrete time evolution to a time dependent unitary, so it's just a way to apply unitary to do the, this change. By convexity, we can also fix uh, the initial state of the environment to be something. We don't know what it is, but we can uh, deal with this in the paper. Uh, and also, the state on the probe here, we assume we always provide the same state, let it evolve together uh, with the environment through this unitary, and then we perform a measurement of the field at the end and collect the sequence out of this result. Right? So it's a kind of similar picture. And yes, so if we group together this operation in the middle here, right, when we do the identity on the, the environment, we can just construct a, a measurement and recuperation of this probe state, and we have this, uh, these operators. And then basically what we're trying to optimize here is this uh, function here, which is the probability over the multi-time measurements, right? Given a certain environment dimension of consumption. And we just have this uh, intercalation of unitaries and measurements here. Uh, and this is the optimization we're going to do. Uh, and here in this case, we actually want to do a, a strict outer approximation. We don't want to just with gradient descent. So we really try to find a way to construct an SDP that can solve this. To do this, we went to the joint amino cost representation of the channel, like was mentioned by Marco. Uh, and it's basically you split the each time step into copies of the original state, and then you transform all these measurements you perform into a, like a, a tiny localized measurement. Right? And the unitaries is you group them all together into a, a, a joint evolution between all these separate qubit spaces at each time. Right? And we had to perform a lot of uh, relaxations and optimizations in the computer as well to turn this into a SAP you can actually solve. The details are really technical and don't fit into this talk. But I just wanted to give it like a really outline of the final results. So basically you have all the fixed stuff you have, the dimensions of your assumptions, the space of your environment and, and system that you can fix your convex to be something pure. Uh, then this is the objective function you get in the end, which you group all of this stuff, all the measurements into this X operator. And you, to approximate this, uh, this unitary as a separable object, this time unitary, we have to approximate this variable we're optimizing here as something that's a, that's a symmetric uh, and should it be a separable state. But separability is very difficult to implement in SDPs. So what we do is we go to cement through symmetric extensions, and we add more copies of the unitary that we trace out. And this, in the limit of adding infinite copies of extra unitaries that we trace out, and then you just the sequence you want, you get something that's separable. So this SDP is a convergent hierarchy for the actual problem. So this is why we have this extra idea here, which is the trace of the actual problems. So here you only have some constraints that see the unitaries are like permutation variants, and the unitaries if you do the trial representation, they become a pure state. Uh, then we, we have the condition of rank one, and it's satisfied automatically by the complexity of the problem, because it's the solution of the boundary. So in the end, you have this SDP. And uh, the solutions, like I said, they're going to form a hierarchy. So as you add, this is the L is the limit of the sequence. And as you add more copies, this bound is going to converge to the exact bound, upper bound for all possible evolutions and all possible things, right? And these bounds, even though they're upper bounds, is really act as weaknesses for the dimension of the environment or the effective environment that's compatible with your statistics. So if you have a statistics for a given sequence and you assume a given dimension for your environment interacting with this, if you violate one of the, uh, the, the appropriate bound, you know that the, your environment has to be uh, of higher dimension. So this is very nice. If we could solve it, it would be great. But this is actually super difficult to do. It's a massive problem just for the most simple case. We can do some simplification by going to the symmetric space, so we can represent this object directly in the appropriate space, we simplify a lot. But even this is not sufficient, so it has too many variables to solve. So there's like 600,000 variables and 300,000 constraints for the basic case. And the positive constraint of this object will require three terabytes of memory just to solve, which is insane. So we were almost giving up, but then I came up with a way to find 
sparse version of the problem. And this is an heuristic thing that we're, we were uh, very surprised that it works so well. And with this sparse representation of the problem, we actually get a massive reduction in the variables and constraints. And this technique is very, very general. It doesn't apply specifically to this problem. Any sparse, any massive problem like this that has a sparse objective function would apply this technique. So if you have such a problem, you might want to talk to me about this, because I think it could be useful. Uh, and use this positive heuristic for a particular choice of measurements, we actually get an exact solution. So we didn't lose anything, which is pretty nice. So uh, these are some numerical results. You don't have to look too, too detailed into it. So in the trivial environment case of the test, we can actually compute the bound analytically. And we see that it matches the analytical bound we have here. Uh, we also can do PPP constraints to improve the convergence on a separable set, so you don't need too many copies. And we see that also improves a lot. For the cubic environment case, you actually have a, a, for the particular choice of measurements we do, uh, we actually have a mapping to the original first paper we have. So we could compare the probability of this sequence with the probability we got from the gradient descent techniques for the first part. And we see here that uh, you have a nice convergence for the SAP to the best on value, which is the lower bound. So it seems like to be in agreement, so it seems to work pretty well. Right, so this is just a quick outline of the kind of relaxations that were necessary, and it's a lot of steps to make it actually tractable and easy. Uh, yes, so this is just the final conclusions. We don't have proofs for the certain conjectures. We don't know why there's scenarios where there's no quantum advantage. We lack some concrete physical interpretation, so this would be nice to discuss with others to adapt this to actual more practical things. Uh, we don't know if we can do this in continuous measures as we asked before uh, to kind of get rid of this discreteness. It would be nice to see how. Uh, there's also the planting, of course, to generalize the significant outputs. It's more difficult, but there's a lot of interesting combinatorical and other preliminary results we have that are still unpublished. And yes, we just need to have ma better mathematical tools to test this. And that's it. Uh, in my 
addition to that, with coherences you have available, right? You can stash information in the coherences and then restore it later. Uh, I'm not sure if I still have the slide here. Uh, I, I had a slide for how to do the optimum model for the one thing sequence to complicate the bound, violates its bound. And it's, that's the behavior you see. You see that you stash a lot of stuff in the middle of coherences, and with the interface, you can kind of restore the probability, so you don't have to use uh, in the class of case, you always make a mistake and you always have to carry this in and mistake forever. You put the mechanics you don't have to do this. So I expect that it's going to be But this is not always having more information. Yeah. So wouldn't you then just expect the transition to some of the deterministic to happen? But just yeah, exactly. I would be, I originally expect that quantum mechanics would have some advantage like that, that you would even have some deterministicity. But when we formulated the difference from facts and looked at the literature a little bit more, we found that this results that if you have a deterministic distribution, uh, uh, excuse me, a deterministic model, quantum model that produces a thing, then you have an equivalent model that's classified as the same thing. So with this notion of deterministic complexity, then it's pretty clear, and we have a little proof in the paper, that if you don't have that enough memory, either class of quantum, you're going to have some sub deterministic behavior. Now, why there's an advantage in general, I think. I don't have a very good intuition. Uh, it also ties together that uh, the data that I mentioned that in, if you remove the states, quantum mechanical advantage that appears in some case. So it would be very difficult to understand why. I think that would answer the question and understand better where the information is in the quantum case. Great, thanks. Well, that's the uh,